Okay, good morning everyone. We should probably get started. Um, I wanted to uh, uh, say that uh, this is Jack Van Horn from the uh, BD2K Training Coordinating Center um, at the University of Southern California and I'm delighted to introduce our uh, Section 1 lecture this morning um, on Data Indexing and Retrieval by Dr. William Hirsch, who's Professor and Chair of the Department of Medical Informatics and Clinical Epidemiology at the Oregon Health and Science University. Um, we're delighted to have Bill here this morning and uh, we look forward to his presentation. Bill? Stage is yours. Okay, thank you, John. Is the is my voice uh, volume okay? It's perfect. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, thank you for inviting me to um, uh, to give this lecture, um, and um, uh, I um, I'm honored to be uh, part of this course, which um, uh, is just a further recognition of the importance of data science and biomedical informatics in uh, biomedical research, and and for um, NIH. Let's see if I get my slides to move here. Okay. So um, <clears throat> today is um, really an introduction to this whole section, um, and this the following five weeks after today will um, drill down into the topics under the second bullet. Um, and um, I was asked to kind of address this issue as a whole, so I thought I would step back and give the big picture. Um, in um, an area um, that is derived from information retrieval or IR or search. Um, many of you know this is an area I've uh, been doing research for uh, several decades and um, as we uh, transition from looking to find um, documents towards looking to find data, uh, there are some issues that um, uh, we need to address and um, uh, make some modifications of what we do. So I, I thought in this lecture that I would first kind of give the big overview of search um, and uh, drilling down into areas such as content, indexing, and retrieval. Probably um, some of this is uh, familiar uh, to you all and certainly probably almost everyone listening has done search. Um, and then I'll, um, <clears throat> the way I decided to address the topics was to give just a brief high-level overview and then ask some questions that you could think about um, when you um, actually um, listen into those lectures in the coming weeks. Um, a little bit more about myself. Um, uh, as John mentioned, I'm chair of the Department of Medical Informatics and Clinical Epidemiology uh, here in the School of Medicine at OHSU. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to email me. Um, I have a website which actually um, has a link to a PDF of these slides and the references that I cite. I've also sent that to John if they want to put it on their site as well. Um, I also um, write a blog called The Informatics Professor, um, and I'm, I'm not a real heavy-duty Twitter person, but I do um, tweet and, and follow things on Twitter. Um, I've also written a book. It's, it's actually getting a little, a little aged, but uh, the basic principles are still sound um, on information retrieval, which was actually published in 2009. So, um, uh, in addition to lecturing on this topic today, I, I'm actually hoping to demonstrate something else, which is related to the grant that uh, my group here at OHSU has from the BD2K program. We're one of the, um, I believe it's up to about 12 or 15 uh, uh, centers funded to do curriculum development. Um, ours is under the Open Educational Resources um, uh, Initiative and we received that grant actually a couple years ago and I, I give a link here to our um, page which is um, slowly uh, filling up with the content that we're um, aiming to uh, develop. So again, I'll, I'll give an overview of information retrieval, introduce the specific topics, and then the secondary aim is to actually demonstrate what one can do with open educational resources. In fact, um, uh, essentially what I've done for this lecture is um, pull slides from two of our modules, one on information retrieval, one on ontologies, um, and then I've modified them to fit this, and that's the purpose of open educational resources is for people to be able to not only use the materials to learn from, but also to teach um, and under a, a Creative Commons kind of license. Um, so let me start then with um, data and information retrieval. 
Um, I'll, I'll show you some figures that I think give a perspective on um, what we're doing when we're trying to do information retrieval, um, the process, the knowledge discovery, and then some of the uh, challenges in the modern era uh, for information retrieval. Um, so um, I like to think, I know that last week um, Dr. Mewson talked about um, the life cycle of, of data. Um, I actually have a similar, this figure actually comes from my book, um, for, for me to try to figure out what it is we're retrieving when we're looking up scientific information and now increasingly data. Um, so most um, scientific knowledge is generated through research, usually new research. In this day and age, research can not only be um, things in labs, things in clinical trials, but of course, um, uh, reanalysis of, of data, uh, things like systematic reviews and meta-analysis or uh, going into either biological or clinical data and doing um, further analysis. If we want to publicize that research, we write up the results into a paper, um, submit it for publication to usually a journal or conference proceedings, goes through a peer review process. It, may be rejected and you have to revise it and resubmit and sometimes you get caught in that cycle quite a bit but if you're persistent and you have decent research it will eventually be accepted and then you'll publish it uh, typically in a journal although that may be changing over time um, when you do publish it um, there's a there, you see some dotted lines here of um, things that that may happen so you may actually have to relinquish copyright that's a, a big issue that could probably take an hour in and of itself I won't address in today's talk um, your work may make it into secondary publications reviews textbooks things like that and of course if it's if your research is any good it will generate new questions um, that need to be um, asked or it will um, generate data that others may want to uh, further analyze um, these days, um, particularly biological, like genomic data, tends to go into data repositories, less so clinical data, though that will be changing over time. So historically, uh, the focus of information retrieval has been to look for those documents. Um, but now, of course, uh, there is the potential ability to actually, to actually, to actually find it. Another way I look at information retrieval is as a funnel, and again, this comes from my book, um, where um, the process of information retrieval is where we really are searching over all the literature, like when we go to PubMed, and in the process we find some possibly relevant literature with our search, and then we select what's definitely relevant. But of course we may want to do more with that. We may want to actually do text mining on the descriptions and the papers, or we may want to get at the tables, or even ultimately to the data. We, we may want structured or actionable knowledge. That's more the domain of information extraction and text mining. Those uh, processes usually make use of natural language processing, machine learning, um, other kinds of things. Um, the information retrieval is, I wouldn't call it a solved problem, but it's a problem that there's a lot of um, widespread commercialized solutions, um, whereas information extraction, text mining is something that that is more starting to emerge. Uh, there, there are some uh, commercial companies, but there's also a lot of research uh, systems that do that as well. Um, so focusing in on the uh, process of information retrieval, what we're ultimately aiming to find is content. And I use that word content deliberately to re really cast the net broadly, anything from papers to images, videos, and of course data. Um, we um, with, in order to be able to find that content, we have to go through an indexing process. I'll talk about that in more detail in a moment. Some way of basically generating metadata, data that describes data about the content. So when we have that metadata, uh, we can then have users who are seeking to retrieve things enter queries. And they enter queries in the metadata and a search engine, and you're, I'm sure you're all familiar with search engines like Google and PubMed, will um, connect will will match that metadata from the queries to what to the content so the user can retrieve um, 
information retrieval when I started working in this field in the 1980s was something that you oftentimes had to go to a librarian um, or uh, used to pay money for dial-up uh, internet or dial-up actually into the systems themselves over time-sharing networks, CompuServe, AOL. Um, now, of course, um, all of us have computers and phones um, and essentially, um, essentially everyone has used a search engine. In fact, some browsers like uh, uh, Apple Safari will, if you're, what you type into the URL box doesn't match a URL, it'll throw you into a search engine. Um, and people search for health related information. Um, and uh, the latest statistics 71% of internet users, meaning 59% of all adults, search for information, 35% using it for self diagnosis. And of course, this is not just a US phenomenon, it uh, comes from the entire world. Um, search is considered an integral application. Many uh, software packages have search built into them. Um, enterprises uh, develop search capabilities across their uh, assets and so forth. And we even have um, search engine optimization, something those of us doing research in the early days never thought of where people would be willing to pay money to have their search results move up higher uh, in the rankings. Um, unfortunately, uh, some of us have last names that are not that common, like H-E-R-S-H, -E uh, so I fortunately have never had to pay money to um, have my uh, rankings elevated. If you type my name into Google, I come right at the top. And just to show you how mainstream, I'm sure many, if not all of you, have been to these uh, search systems. Uh, PubMed and Google are, are probably the uh, PubMed for anything biomedical and Google for anything. Um, the, we also know that uh, access to information is really part and parcel of health and biomedicine now. Um, Incel back in 2003 said that biology is becoming an information science. The, the old days of, of capturing things in your laboratory notebook is being replaced by databases and spreadsheets and all other kinds of things. Um, we hear about pharmaceutical companies competing for informatics talent. Um, on the clinical side, we have uh, clinicians trying to keep up with the knowledge of their field, where they're in an era when there's about 75 clinical trials and 11 systematic reviews published each day. And, and searching is ubiquitous. It's even part of, uh, for those of you who are familiar with electronic health records, the meaningful use uh, regulations uh, and, and uh, one of the requirements is the ability to do text search over electronic health record notes. So searching is, is pretty common. Um, but we have some challenges. Um, we, uh, perhaps 20, 30 years ago, there was not that much information online. Now we have the opposite problem. We're overloaded. Um, we have challenges searching because there are multiple ways to say the names of diseases, the names of genes, uh, symptoms. Um, uh, searching can be a challenge when there's so much information out there. Of course, there's also the converse problems where we have many words and terms that have multiple meanings. Uh, the word cold, um, uh, it can be the temperature cold, the disease cold, and so forth. Or um, there was just a paper in, I think it was Nature within the last few weeks about how, or maybe it was PLOS, but uh, uh, how um, uh, spreadsheets can mess up uh, gene analyses because genes like APR-1 are converted um, by things like Excel into the date April 1st. And of course, so APR-1 has multiple meanings. And then this other issue, again, which is uh, a very interesting topic to me and probably many of you, but it's just beyond the scope of today, is how we balance that open access, making um, the fruits of research, most of which are paid for by the government, uh, freely available versus the real cost of producing it and maintaining it. Um, so these are some of the challenges we'll face. I, I'm not going to solve all these uh, problems today. So let me drill a little further into um, uh, some of the aspects of information retrieval. Let me start with content. And I, again, I use that word content in a real broad sort of way. So back um, in the 1960s, 70s, even into the 1980s, uh, Networks were slow. We mostly connected by telephone modems. Disks didn't have that much capability. So most of the content we searched on was abstracts and mostly of journal articles. 
But then as the technology improved, the network bandwidth improved, the whole system became more affordable for individuals and organizations to connect to. We, and these aren't really in time-wise order, but um, they're, they're sort of. We, we then moved to full text. So instead of the abstracts now, we could put the whole article um, online. Um, we could move things like textbooks. We could publish reports. And so those are predominantly text-based. Um, still, the memory and bandwidth requirements are modest, but then, then we start moving into hypermedia, uh, where we have web pages, images, sounds, and videos, and so forth. And the, the data, the bandwidth requirements and storage requirements start to increase. And then also the development of structured collection, textbooks that are linked across each other, um, large databases, compendia, and so forth. And so these, the middle bullet, those content materials have been increasing in size. In fact, we pretty much take them for granted. And then now we move into the new era when we can no longer just publish the results of our research, but we can publish our data. And um, the, if you read the, the medical literature or any other uh, source, there's uh, controversies about you know, how, how readily available should data be, um, someone coining the term uh, research parasites, which um, made a lot of people upset. Um, what, what, are the, what are the issues behind uh, making data available? I, I won't comment on the economic or political issues, but I will comment on the um, technology and informatics uh, issues around uh, data uh, retrieval. Let me um, then um, talk, so I talked about content, let me talk a little about indexing. In indexing is critical because we need somehow to be able to find the content that we're looking for. And this is where metadata comes in, data about data. Um, we assign metadata to content items and we can do it in automated fashions or using manual methods. Um, automated systems, uh, things like Google, things like the word search in PubMed, um, will very easily pull out the words in um, the, the, the records or the, the documents and so forth, and um, we can assign measures to them that allow us to rank the output. Um, any um, uh, uh, undergraduate computer science student can write algorithms to extract out the words of a document. It's a, it's a known a relatively known thing to do. Um, we've also, uh, since the beginning of things like Medline, had manual indexing where there are um, experts who, um, in the case of Medline, follow a protocol where they um, assign terms from the medical, from, from a controlled vocabulary, in this case, MESH or the medical subject headings, and they follow a protocol where they look at different parts of the article. Um, in a process that takes uh, about 15 to 20 minutes because there's so many. So they focus on things like the introduction and the conclusion and the figure legends. And then they assign anywhere from five to 10 mesh terms and a few of them get designated as central concepts. There's other, so those are assigning subjects, what the content is about, but there's other attributes we might want. For example, we might want to know the author. Um, I actually do a fair amount of author searching um, oftentimes I know I want to go find someone's paper that was published in a certain place, so I enter their author name. And in, um, in PubMed, uh, when you type two words together and the second word only has one or two characters, it will try to map that into an author. Um, we might want to know the source, the, the journal that it came from, it was a report that's published by an institution, etc. Um, we might want to know the publication type. This is particularly important well, in a number of places, but one of the major ones is with clinicians who are looking, for example, to make an evidence-based decision and use a randomized controlled trial. Um, there's things like secondary source in, in the case of Medline, and this uh, is where we have linkage to gene resources, protein resources, all the other uh, myriad of databases that are available through the NLM, the National Library of Medicine, and other organizations. Um, we may want to know the grant number because we're, for whatever reason. Um, and then, of course, the location. The bibliographic databases in the old days told us where to go into the library stacks to, to find the journal. Now they, the location gives us a, a URL or basically a, digital, a, a DOI 
a digital object identifier that's converted into a URL. So right from the Medline record, we can click a link and go to the publisher's website to retrieve the article. Um, it, it, and, and sometimes we run into paywalls and, and so forth. But, but at least there's a link to w where we can go get it. We don't have to go searching through the stacks in the days of old. Um, a little bit more about mesh. Um, uh, mesh, well, all indexing vocabularies, they they're usually consist of control terms. They're usually organized in a hierarchy. I have a figure on this slide that's basically a vertical slice through a piece of mesh. Um, start, mesh has uh, 16 trees, anatomy, diseases, chemicals, and drugs, one of which is diseases. Um, and uh, you see I'm basically traversing down the hierarchy cardiovascular diseases, vascular diseases, hypertension, uh, et cetera. And um, all in all, there's about 26,000 terms in MeSH, and then there's a number of synonyms, so you can express the terms in different ways. And if you ever want to go look at MeSH, there's a nice uh, website that the NLM keeps. Uh, it's basically a MeSH browser. Um, on to the retrieval side. Remember, the purpose of doing indexing is so we can retrieve. Um, and there's really two kind of general approaches that search systems use. Um, one is the requirement for um, Boolean operators, uh, and, or, and not, um, and uh, helping you to narrow your set or to express things in different ways. Not is less frequently used, but sometimes we use it to filter out certain things. Or what we see more commonly is natural language systems where we don't actually have to explicitly um, type the Boolean operators, although oftentimes things are done. For example, in Google, the default is to do an AND between all of the words that you type into Google. There's ways to override that, um, but that's uh, Google's uh, basic function. Um, the natural language, the, the Boolean systems basically give us sets. Um, things, uh, sources like PubMed will sort them by reverse chronological order. Um, with natural language systems, we usually get the results ranked. And so when you do a Google search or really any system that uses natural language searching, the results will be, will be sorted, sometimes by the word occurrence and frequencies of words that are common to what the user has entered and what's in the content, or the use of inlinks, which of course was um, popularized, uh, it really was the basis of the Google search engine and is, is part of the, the reason why it works so well um, in, a, in the setting of the World Wide Web with billions of documents, how many pages point to you? And um, that's w one of the things that goes into how Google ranks its results. So over the years, it, they've added a lot more, and now it's all proprietary. But, but the original feature of Google was that uh, page rank algorithm that was described by Brin in 1998. Um, a few more comments about metadata. Um, which is data about data, so it tells us what the data items mean, and we've most, there's different types of metadata. We've mostly been talking about descriptive metadata that enables us to discover or identify it, but there's also structural metadata that describes how the, or, the data itself is structured, um, the fields that are used and so forth, and administrative data on, on how, it's managed, how it's managed, and this can include rights management, so who can access it, when and how, and also how it's uh, been preserved, how it's been archived and stored. Um, when, when we talk about IR systems, the, the best example is literature uh, indexing and annotation, um, but metadata exists for databases, uh, almost any kind of uh, computerized resource. Um, one um, final question I'll um, just uh, cover briefly is uh, how do we know how well we've done when we search? Um, I actually, I and many other people who work in information retrieval are always very interested in this question um, and have done research uh, looking at it. Um, there's a lot of questions we can ask if we want to know how well a search is. Uh, is a search system used that we make available to users? Are they satisfied? A lot of the research has focused on relevant information. How much relevant information did they find? A another question we may ask is, did they complete their desired task? And um, I've looked at that mo mostly from the standpoint of clinicians over the years. Um, when we're looking for relevant information, there's the 
well-known measures of recall and precision, of recall being of the proportion of materials out there that are relevant to the, the proportion of content, what do we get back? So retrieved and relevant divided by relevant and then precision is the of what we actually retrieved, how much is relevant. So retrieved and relevant divided by retrieved. And there, there's a whole bunch of issues when you use these uh, measures in research and so I'll, um, I, I won't go into that detail but there's, you can search uh, the, the literature in medicine, computer science, for all kinds of work that's been done in this area. So let me, um, I'm hoping to leave a little bit of time for questions, and so what I was going to spend the rest of the lecture uh, doing was uh, going through the um, topics of Section 1, and again, I'm going to um, present it uh, to you um, asking questions, and I know each of the lecturers in the following five weeks will We'll go into details, and maybe this for you uh, could set the stage for, for what you might want to hear when they um, go into much more detail in each of these. So um, the next week's lecture is uh, entitled Finding and Accessing Data Sets, Indexing, and Identifiers. So a, a lot of what I've been talking about, but focused on data collections. And um, there's a, n a number of emerging um, sites that, that are basically search engines for data now. And I list two here, although I, I can think of many more off the top of my head. But um, uh, data site was one of the first ones. It's a way to find data sets. And data site is not limited to medicine. It covers many topics. Um, there's another one that's more focused on medicine um, from the uh, BioCaddy project, which um, I believe the speaker next week is from that project, um, datamed.org, that lets you search for collections of data. And um, why would you want to find data? Usually because you may be interested in doing research with it, you want to uh, replicate the results of, of a study from the data that they collected and so forth. And um, so I think the question to think about here is um, I, most information retrieval has been done with information and as we move from information to data, are there any issues that become unique? Um, it, it turns out there are with, with data sets um, in terms, uh, whereas for example a journal article is published and then it's done, maybe there might be a, an erratum sometimes or, or perhaps it's even retracted, but by and large it becomes a static document. Um, data sets might not always be static, um, they might have snapshots at different times, but those are some of the things we need to know when we're creating data retrieval systems to set up um, and allow the searcher to be able to search on those sorts of attributes. Um, another issue, uh, or another, the second uh, topic will be data curation and version control. Um, data, again, data curation um, can sometimes become a little more challenging than, say, just journal articles um, because data sets have a context and they may grow or change. But it's important to remember that, that data doesn't exist in a vacuum. Data gets collected when there's usually some sort of experiment or observation going on. Um, the only data in the data set that, gets, that is collected is th that which, with, which was collected. And so sometimes when uh, people do um, experiments, they may not collect certain types of data that actually could have been collected or perhaps they just couldn't, they couldn't have been collected because they didn't think about collecting those things. Uh, probably every researcher has done at least one experiment in their lives when they think to themselves, oh, why didn't I measure this or that um, when we were doing the experiment? Um, so um, the, uh, the figure here, it comes from the uh, University of California Merced uh, uh, website. I, I was looking for a good picture of research data curation and I found this one. And this really highlights some um, uh, the challenges of, of um, when we do an experiment, uh, we, we need a data management plan, in fact NIH grants now require that, and, and there's a lot of detail that goes into storage. We, we collect the data, uh, we have to describe it, um, analyze it, um, and um, 
eventually, when we're at least done with the initial experiments, we move on then to archiving the data um, and publishing. Now, historically, we've just archived, researchers have archived data in their own files, uh, hopefully at least electronically, though that's not always the case, probably not, not, so, not, not so much anymore, but um, uh, oftentimes those archives are private. The, the study is uh, published, although increasingly researchers have to publish their data, especially in the omics world, um, less so in the clinical world, though we're seeing a lot of conversation going on about that. Um, and of course, as research is done with um, extractions of data from electronic health records and other clinical data sources, not to mention all of the um, personal devices, wearables and stuff that people have, so lots of data. Um, and then um, um, I guess actually usually the research question comes at the beginning of the study and I, I suspect that's what's actually meant here, but, but again when we get data we then can ask new questions. Now we always have to be careful um, because again data was collected for a certain purpose back to that issue of context, but we may have a new research question and so then we search the data and pull out the data elements we need and reuse them. And of course we need to keep an eye to reproducibility so if we go through this cycle again with a new research question we have to archive the data in a way that we can reproduce the analysis that we've done with the data. So when you hear the lecture on data curation and version control you can think about again how the, how the data are described and um, kept up to date. Um, another, um, uh, the third uh, topic you'll hear in this series is on ontologies and uh, th this is actually another example of pulling um, some materials from our uh, resources in, in our um, open educational resources. So um, this figure comes from one of our modules that's uh, authored by uh, Melissa Handel, some of you know, who does a lot of work in ontologies. Um, so um, in case you don't know what an ontology is, um, as uh, it's defined in our module and it's defined similarly elsewhere, a formal conceptualization of a specified domain. So Clearly the terms need to be defined. Um, sometimes people call things like mesh and other control vocabularies and ontology. I, I think the purists would actually argue that they're not. Um, mesh is a fine uh, medical vocabulary, a collection of, of, of a, a comprehensive collection of terms that are used to describe what's in the medical literature. But an ontology structures the domain so you understand the relationship. So for example you see here that um, we're looking at certain types of neural cells and those cells are, are, are child or, or more um, refined from the ones higher in the diagram. Um, but there's a certain type of cell so the hippocampal astrocyte is capable of certain things and from a different part of the ontology, one that, in fact, this is from the gene ontology, describes specific functions. And so the hippocampal astrocyte is capable of those functions. It also may have some unique parts. And it's also part of organs. So for example, it's part of the brain, or also part of the hippocampus, which is part of the brain. And then um, uh, there's some further refinements. So, um, in an ontology, the relationships between all the terms are defined, and this not only organizes the data, but it allows us to make logical inference. We, if, if for example, a hippocampal astrocyte is a cell, we, there are certain attributes of cell that can be inherited down the um, hierarchy that we can um, infer. And, and this enables us to do more sophisticated um, data queries. Um, Ontologies can be complex, and um, um, but they they provide a much richer description. And so the questions you might ask with ontologies is is how we can optimally index and then do retrieval um, using ontologies when we're looking for 
data, but not only for data, can, can we use these also for looking for um, literature and other kinds of things if they've been indexed uh, using an ontology. Um, the, the week that follows will be a talk on metadata standards. Um, there are many metadata standards to choose from, and sometimes they duplicate each other, which can be a problem, but oftentimes they're different because the task that the metadata is put to is, is different. Um, there's actually a, a standards body, the um, International Organization for Standards, or ISO, that um, actually has, a, they, ISO is the international standards body, has standards for many, many things. Um, one of which is metadata. There are standards for metadata repositories and other um, sorts of things. In the information retrieval arena, there are a number of metadata standards. Um, the, the Medline record, when we search PubMed, or there's other ways to search Medline, the, the elements, the fields in that Medline record are metadata elements. So the, the author names, the title, the mesh terms, the secondary source identifiers, all those things are um, a part of the metadata. Med Medline is basically a collection of metadata records for the medical literature. Another um, metadata standard uh, some of you may be familiar with is um, Dublin Core Metadata. Dublin Core Metadata got its start in the relatively early days of the World Wide Web in the 1990s. It originally, well, actually still consists of 15 fields um, that, that are actually have, some of them have analogs to what's in Medline. So the creator, the name of the resource, the uh, URI, which maps to the URL. Um, there's a field called subject. There's also a field called rights that, that, that lists the, the rights management in terms of who can access it. And Dublin Core Metadata has been extended, really built on top of, by many, many groups, um, one of which is Datasite, which I've already um, mentioned. Um, they have a, a, a metadata for each data source, and their, their system for metadata builds on top of the Dublin Core. Um, and then also groups like BioCaddy um, that um, map among a variety of metadata standards um, with a focus on biomedical data. So whereas Medline has that focus on biomedical literature, Dublin Core had the focus originally on web resources, mainly HTML pages, but expanding to other things, uh, BioCaddy is focused on biomedical data. So the question, one of the questions you might ask in that talk is, what approaches to metadata are optimal for data indexing? All the kinds of things we might want to ask about data resources when we're trying to retrieve them. And then, of course, how do we build retrieval pages? And um, the, um, uh, the, the uh, dot, hold on, data, what was that? Uh, datamed.org, sorry, um, is, is one approach. And, and what I know it's a work in progress, and what fields do they need to add, what search capabilities, and so forth. Um, the, um, the final um, uh, topic in, in this section is provenance, and um, uh, data provenance is important. Basically, data provenance, what is it? It's, it's where your data come from, and whenever I talk about data provenance, I always like to give an example, and uh, a few years ago, um, some clinical informatics colleagues and I published a paper on, on some of the challenges with using clinical data from electronic health records in research, and ju just a number of caveats. In fact, that's the title of the paper, caveats for using clinical data in uh, research. And um, provenance is one of the big issues, and, and I think this will be an example. Um, and there's analogous examples from uh, laboratory experiments and so forth. But a simple question we might ask when we have a clinical data source, is a patient on a medication? Are they taking a medication? Um, well, there's actually multiple ways that, that that's expressed, um, and we really need to understand each one and also the limitations, because sometimes um, the uh, physician might just write, I'm putting a patient on this medication, but there might not be an order or a prescription for it. Um, 
So um, once the order is made, though, then the data gets sent to a pharmacy, either in the hospital or if it's an outpatient to a community to pharmacy in the community. Um, but again, there there's not a hundred percent of prescriptions that make that journey. Of course, they uh, end up in the pharmacy. Do the does the patient actually get the prescription filled? And then actually, do they take the medications? And in, in the hospitals, you have things like medication administration records. Um, and then also when, um, these days when patients come back to hospitals, we often do a process of medication reconciliation. So the, the point of this um, is, is to really show that there's many truths, and I put truths in quote, um, for whether or not a patient is on a medication. And that can be really important if we're doing a research study where we're trying to process the data that's in an electronic health record. Um, so, um, and certainly any reuse of data uh, must take provenance into account. So I'm sure that those of you who are more biologically inclined can, can come up with examples like the one I've given here of how do we really, how do we know what the truth is? How do we know where the data comes from? And so when you're asking, when you're listening to the lecture on uh, data provenance, um, you can ask things like how do we uh, best describe the provenance that's in um, data sets. So at this point I'm going to continue. Um, I'm going to, uh, we wanted to leave some time for questions and um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, as I understand it, people can either raise their hands or uh, electronically um, or type questions into the box. Thank you, Bill. So there's a couple of questions that are uh, in the box that somebody has uh, uh, asked about. Um, they're asking about uh, the storage and retrieval of experimental data. Um, also, are there any standards or common structures like HDF5? And uh, how does this relate to open data sharing? Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I have to admit, I'm not um, an expert in storage of biological data. Um, I, I do know that that probably that area is more um, developed than storage of, of things like clinical trials data, which um, may sometimes just be in very ad hoc kinds of ways. Um, so I would that question, I, um, especially on the specific uh, data storage, I would probably need to defer um, to to someone, um, and, and and maybe one of the lectures in the coming week would be able to answer that. Yeah, there was also the question about how this all relates to open data sharing initiatives. Yeah, sure. Um, well, um, um, uh, I, I think that open data is actually really, in some well, in most ways, really separate from how you store the data. Um, when data, you know, becomes open, the question, of course, is how open it is. Um, is it just sitting there freely available on the internet, or um, do, do you have to uh, file a request with the uh, originator of the data? Um, if there's potentially identifiable data in there on people, um, do, do, you, do you have to um, go through some sort of IRB process? I, I, I think it all depends. Uh, you know, I think we, um, um, I, I'm, I'm an advocate of open data, but I also understand that we need to uh, protect researchers um, who, um, you know, create the data and know the context of it. They, they should be willing to share it, but they also have some interest in um, uh, getting the most out of it. And then also when we start to get into data um, on people, um, uh, you know, especially when we start uh, massively sequencing genomes and if we don't um, uh, have ways to keep that data um, private and de-identified, um, we, we have to be careful for those things. There, there's actually a number of studies that it's been shown um, how you can re sometimes, depending on what data you have, re-identify people um, from so-called de-identified data sets. We also, it also looks like, also Bill, we like have a, um, some have library scientists library out there. And uh, so a couple of them have asked questions about um, are uh, librarians and library scientists being included on data management teams, and should they be? And also, how does uh, the ontological structures that you've described, how do they link in with, like, MeSH, for example? Sure. Um, 
I certainly believe that um, librarians bring important skills to um, the uh, um, the groups that manage data. Um, I I don't think that researchers always realize the um, you, you know you always hear stories about researchers who lost their old data or they can't figure out what it what the data was and um, that's why it's important um, to to bring those with the kind of expertise that librarians have um, to make sure that your um, data is documented well, um, that, that the you know met metadata is there to define what your data elements are so um, so that you have good definitions and, and can go back to your data in the future through the metadata to remember um, exactly what um, what the data is. So there's absolutely a role uh, for those sorts. And the second question again was? Oh, is uh, how do uh, do the ontological structures that you've described, oh, yeah. how might they link in with mesh? Sure. Um, um, the, you know, certainly the, you know, like I showed you the ontology, um, uh, you know, the, of the cells and the certain ne neural cell types. Um, the individual um, items in the ontology should be um, uh, in, in controlled terminology sets like mesh uh, or other ones. Mesh, mesh tends to go into more details around uh, diseases. It, it tends to have more of a focus on the biomedical literature. Um, but there's other um, controlled vocabulary sets. So the, the terms in an ontology should be um, from, from a controlled vocabulary set. Um, and then um, if something, say, indexes the literature like the way that um, uh, mesh does that that you could then map you, even though mesh doesn't capture those relationships but you would at least be able to map from the terms and of course there's another uh, important resource here that that we should mention which is the um, the unified medical language system or UMLS that's been uh, developed um, by the National Library of Medicine um, the UMLS is a collection of terminologies and there are basically synonym linkages across vocabulary. So if you find a term in one controlled vocabulary and it occurs in another, you can use the UMLS meta thesaurus to map across those um, terminology sets. And so, um, so, so again, the, the terms in an ontology should definitely be from a controlled vocabulary. If they're not, they should become part of one. Great. We had a, a question about uh, that you had mentioned that you'd like to see more clinical data being deposited into um, open repositories. And could you possibly speak about the time frame that you might see this happening in and what stakeholders might drive it? And also maybe comment about how so doing would help to uh, uh, encourage reproducibility, avoid misrepresentation of data, um, and the like. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I. I you know, I certainly support the notion that, that data should be open and people should have access to it, especially data that's been collected uh, the, on projects that are funded by the government, by our tax dollars. I, I do, though, think we, we need to be careful. Um, and so there probably needs to be a process. I know, for example, in some of the NLM databases that, that have the genome-wide association studies, there are processes where you have to apply to get the data. Um, the, the, the two things I think we need to be careful I, um, I, I don't think that researchers should be able to hoard their data, but researchers know a lot of the context of the experiments that they run. Um, they spend a, lo a lot of time and effort collecting the data, so they should certainly be able to you know, get the most out of the data when it's first generated, the publication. So certainly there should be some period where um, they, are, they, are, they have say a total purview over the data um, then you know when it's a reasonable amount of time and you can argue how long you know six months 12 months uh, some say things like five years which is probably too long um, then it, it should go into some controlled release sort of format I, I think especially going to be true as we do more things with patients uh, you know with people that identify them um, uh, their, their genome I, I know that there are some methods and I, I'm no expert in them to um, uh, partially de-identify gene variants and things like that I mean but the reality is is that um, 
there, there will be, um, I mean, people have shown you can even, the, the famous study by Latanya Sweeney where she was able to identify the governor of Massachusetts in a health database by purchasing the voter registration rolls for the city of Cambridge, Massachusetts and, and connecting him uh, through his, I think it was zip code, gender, and date of birth. So I think, I think we need to, so data should be open, but it should be released in a way that's controlled. And uh, I, I think there's a role for IRBs here to um, uh, approve these sorts of things. Because um, th there is always the, uh, you know, another potential of someone, you know, doing an analysis that, that it is not really justified based on the context of the data um, and getting different results. I, I think there's still issues to be worked out, especially when, when we start releasing data that's originally uh, collected by humans. But I certainly um, support the notion of doing that. Uh, there was a question about um, what does the lack of consistent ontologies across all the medical domains from practice to research and back again, does that come at a cost to the, to the country? Um, and could you comment on that? <laughs> yeah, well I can, I can answer the question simply by saying yes, um, but j just to make some additional comments. Um, Yes, you know, I think, and you, you see this now in the clinical informatics world where I spend most of my time, you know, so we've finally, after, after all these years, have achieved widespread adoption of electronic health records. Um, unfortunately, they don't easily talk to each other, even, even when they can exchange the, the, the bits, the, the, the electrons of the data, um, they, they don't readily exchange the meaning. Um, and and you know, probably we'll never achieve perfection on this because different humans interpret different things about patients and so forth. Um, but but a big part of the problem, and and the um, Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT has recognized this now, is that we haven't really adhered to standards. Standards on the elements in medical records, um, standards on the terms that we use to describe diseases, lab tests, and so forth. And there are standards out there. Um, they're not all perfect, but um, they, they go a long way. So I think that we need to encourage standards. Um, and there's standards processes that individuals who really care about them can get involved. Um, but we need to encourage standards in a way that, that we call something the same thing, or, or at least that there's an identifier. We might have different ways of describing it, different synonyms for it but that they ultimately map back to some identifier. We should do that on as much as possible. There, there may be some things that change over time. I, I commonly give an example when, when I was in medical school, there was no hepatitis C or D or however many different types of hepatitis there now. It was all non-A, non-B hepatitis. And so term, terminologies change over time and we, we need to model the, the adaptation of terms. But, but yes, we should strive to use standards um, whenever we can. It should be required by the, the government, the funders, the journals, um, et cetera, um, so that we achieve as much use of it as possible. Well, with that point, the, uh, so another question was, would you uh, care to kind of predict or guess at the chances that in the future a literature will become pre-indexed with uh, people maybe pre-registering their studies against particular data ontologies or uh, with particular methods? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, um, we, certainly the, that possibility exists. I mean, in fact, um, for clinical trials now, they have to be regis registered in clinicaltrials.gov and certainly people who are awarded um, you know, NIH grants have, um, they, they know what they're studying. Um, so they could do that pre-indexing. Of course, you know, sometimes with studies you have unexpected findings. So I don't know that the indexing would, would totally stop um, the, before the, the study was completed. Um, but that's certainly a possibility. And, and you know, uh, you can go search databases like clinicaltrials.gov to find um, you know studies on specific diseases and um, treatments and so forth. Let's see. Do we have any other questions that are good ones? Uh, I'm sure there's a bunch here, and we'll be delighted to to share them with you, Bill. Uh, maybe you can reach out to the to the askers uh, at a later time. But it looks like 
Sure. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, sure. I'd be happy to do that. Or, you know, we can even um, you know make it uh, publicly available. I can type in the answers oh, to the extent be... that I can answer them. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Well, let me uh, kind of bring things to a close here and thank Bill for a fantastic lecture um, in our second of our data science seminar series. Uh, once again, let me apologize to anybody who had some difficulty getting in initially. Um, as uh, it might be clear, uh, we had a peak of 511 of you, and uh, as a consequence, we had to make sure that we could upgrade and accommodate everybody, so we had to uh, update our URL. Uh, the best way to find the information is to go to www.bigdatau.org slash data-science-seminars and follow the instructions there. And so uh, this uh, go-to webinar site will be the site we always come back to. So please spread the word um, and uh, come back and we'll uh, see you again next week. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day.